So thank you everybody for coming. Um, this is a talk on iSCSI, obviously. So if you're here for the talk on NVMe, you're in the wrong place. Um, as I said, my name is Lee Duncan. I work at SUSE. It was kindly paid for me to come here today. So uh, the schedule kind of says I'm supposed to talk 30 minutes and then have questions. I think I have a few too many slides for that, probably 45 minutes worth of slides. So I might skip over some of the low-level detail on some of them. Hopefully, uh, the website will allow me to upload this so that people can get it. So the things I want to talk about today are, uh, obviously, iSCSI and what is it? What value does it have? And then I'm going to do a little, not a live demonstration, but some slides of uh, when I was doing it live on my uh, virtual machine at home. Uh, when I'm setting up an initiator and a target and connecting them, so you'll see how this done. And then if there's time at the end, I'll talk about some extra stuff. So a quick, my background, I've been working on SCSI a long time before that, low-level storage protocols. I started on HPIV in assembly language years ago. And um, so I've been, uh, I work at SUSE now and I maintain the uh, kernel initiator code and the open iSCSI package with a co-maintainer, Chris Leach from Red Hat. And I maintain most of the stuff, sorry, <laughs> if we started too early. Uh, and I maintain all of the initiators and targets for SUSE. I work remotely down by Portland, by the way, if that matters. So uh, before I can really explain what iSCSI is, a little quick background on SCSI, because iSCSI obviously is related. Um, SCSI is just the interfacing between computers and disk drives, started in the mid 80s as a low level specification that included both the protocol and the, the cables, because it was all one then. And then SCSI 2 kind of broke that up into a protocol and transport uh, separate layers. And SCSI 3 is kind of the current maximum, but nobody really fully implements it. So things are SCSI 2, SCSI 3 these days. Um, it's a simple client server architecture. And um, the main thing that we're going to talk about today is logical units, or LUNs. The terms are kind of used interchangeably. Technically, they're different. but So a disk drive, in other words. So iSCSI is just SCSI over I, <laughs> over the internet. It's really SCSI over some transport. I think of it as SCSI over Ethernet, but that's not technically not correct. It's SCSI over TCP IP. Um, but there's also... Uh, uh, SCSI gets transported over other things too, like fiber channels. So this is just a way to transport SCSI over TCP IP. There's some uh, standards that you can Google and find. Uh, they're free to look at. Um, they're really not standards the way SCSI has a standard. They're just requests for comment that have stood at the time. And there's uh, the most common one here. The most common one is 3720. There's my little laser thing. Um, these are extensions that most people ignore or don't pay attention to. And the whole idea is to get remote storage with a uh, local storage protocol. So what value does it have? Well, it's free and open. You can play with it on your Linux box. Um, it's cheap. <laughs> and you don't need any special hardware like Fiber Channel or uh, NVMe even needs special cards. This can just use any, uh, any initiator and any target. There's no real ice SCSI hardware anywhere. It's just a way of uh, getting remote storage over the network. And it's very reliable because it's been around a while now, um, 30 years. I, I'm sorry, I didn't look at the exact date when it started. But, um, so it's fairly reliable. There's not a, a lot of the bugs are cleaning things up or maybe enhancing it. But um, some of the newer technologies, for example, like NVMe, are constantly changing because they're new. So let's talk about the, the main parts of uh, iSCSI. There's, because it has its own terminology. It's uh, like every other technology. They have their own three-letter acronyms and stuff. So the main concepts in iSCSI are initiators, targets, and sessions. It's pretty simple. Initiator talking to a target. And when they talk to each other, they get a session. Just like, it's very similar to logging on to your Linux box. You log on, you're, you have a login session. You log off, no more session. And the reason you log on and don't just do each command interactively is because when you log on, it creates some state that matters. Okay, so uh, let me see if I've covered everything. 
the packages. I want to mention two on uh, my demonstration is on Tumbleweed, which is uh, the free SUSE version of uh, Linux. I'm going to knock this thing off. Um, my, on Tumbleweed, but uh, so my, dem my uh, examples are specific to SUSE packaging. A lot of the distributions package things slightly differently, even if it's the same code underneath. So if you're using Red Hat, I think it's slightly different but similar. So here's a simple client server with a transport diagram. And here's what iSCSI maps onto that. Initiator is the client. The target is the server. So it's always the initiator that some computer saying, I want to write or I want to read. And the logic we know there is our disk drive. There's the packages that we're going to use to demonstrate this on Tumbleweed. And those packages are similar to Red Hat 2 and other distributions. Um, and there's also, I don't know if I mentioned it or I skipped over on a previous slide, but in iSCSI, everything has to have a name. It's kind of like your IPv6 address. It has to be unique in the universe. Um, and so they took the approach of using a text string instead of a bunch of numbers. So the names, it's called uh, the iSCSI qualified name, IQN. And it has this format here that you can see with IQN, and then a year, month, name authority, and unique name. This is like your domain name backwards. So it would be like, I don't know, com.ibm. And the, the year and month is when you got that name. And then this part, you could fill in within your organization however you want. And the, the string could be pretty long. So all you have to do, as long as you have a unique initial name, you can put whatever you want after that. It only has to be unique within your domain. So this is kind of like a block diagram from a different point of view, just ignoring the protocol, but just saying, how does a client program get to the disk drive using iSCSI? And you can see the, here's, it's talking to a SCSI device. So some program is reading and writing to what it thinks is a local SCSI device, but it's being redirected through the kernel over the network to the kernel on the receiving end, where it now gets put into <coughs> a file or a disk drive or memory. This can actually be RAM here if you want, but it can't be very big if you're just using RAM. So uh, to show you uh, the concepts here, what I'm going to do is set up a target and then set up an initiator and then connect them and show that it's actually working. This works over the network, but I did the demonstration all on one system because it's network oriented. You can, you can ping your own IP address, right? So it doesn't actually have to be on two different systems. It could be. The, the network doesn't know. Um, generally, people don't put it over like wide area network, like over the internet, because storage would be ridiculously slow over that. But it's very common to have it over your local network. So uh, we're going to have to figure out where we want to actually put our disk. The target package that we're going to use allows us to put the you know, file, our, our bits, um, could go in a file, just a file on a file system somewhere, or I can use a whole partition of a disk, or I can use a whole disk, or I think I also mentioned it could be in memory. So we have to figure that out well, to set it up, we'll have to pick. And we're also going to have to pick a name and decide how we want to do security. iSCSI has different levels of security, Open iSCSI does and the target package too, that's three times. I need to move over here. Let's see if my thing up here. Yay. Okay, so uh, there's different levels of security and uh, one I'm gonna use in the demonstration is kind of like the middle level called access control list. So the target sets up a list of one or more initiators that it will allow to talk to it. As you can imagine, that's kind of medium security because the initiator is lie about his name. But that's what we're going to do for the demonstration. So the target has two parts in the target CLI package that we're going to use here. It's the target CLI package is really a shell written in Python that runs in user space, but it talks to the kernel through sysfs, if anybody knows what that is. It's just a directory tree that allows user programs to talk to the kernel in various ways. So, this shell allows you to talk to the kernel code. It really does all the work. But it has two parts. It has a front end and a back end. It's very configurable because the back end, as I said, is where you put the bits and you have to decide where you want that to be. It's flexible. You might want it in a file this time and, and this other target might want it to be a whole disk drive. So this allows you to change it around even and have the front end stay the same and they connect. And it will 
show how, how that's done. So as I mentioned, target CLI is the package we're going to use. It's a Python shell. And if you want to install it on uh, Tumbleweed or any of the SUSE things, you can use Zipper. That's our install program. Um, instead of apt-get or whatever is used on others. Um, so you would install it if it's not already installed. It has an interactive mode, which is what we're going to use. If you wanted to do hundreds of these, you could use its batch mode. But it's very shell-like, which is cool. Um, and it has this node, uh, root directory, kind of subdirectory tree, just like Linux does. But it's different, but it's similar enough so that it's familiar. And you can CD up and down this tree. You can LS to see the tree. So that's kind of nice. And it also has, also has command completion. So when you're typing part of a long app thing, you can type tab and let it finish it. It's very handy. There's the empty tree when you first fire this thing up and you haven't configured anything. And uh, I do want to point out the main things that we care about here. The root directory is just to connect everything. But the way this shell works is that the commands that you run are not external commands like in a show you can run ls or ps those are external commands that you're running this everything is internal so they're all internal commands and the commands available depend on the direction you're in so there's different commands here than there is here or even if they are the same name they have different functions like a create here creates a file whereas a create here creates a front end you'll see this in a minute so here it is from the chef from the prompt. Maybe if I turn the back lights off, it'll yeah, help. Yeah, yeah. It's part of the Why? Try to can be, you like this to be better to see. Can you blow the screen up a little bit? Or I don't, I don't know if I can. Uh, make it bigger? I don't know how to do that. Yeah, I think there's something there. Oh, well, see, this This is a, the problem is this isn't interactive with the slide. Oh, so I can't change it. I actually, like, tripled oh, the size I'm of the sorry. font. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, it's reflective. I should have picked another color besides black. So this is, uh, while they're finishing that, I'll show you this again. So this is the same thing as this, just looking at it sideways. So here uh, is my my prompt on my laptop. That helps a bit, but it's still kind of glary. Sorry about that. I'll know next time. White background. So uh, here is the prompt. Let me see if I'm up here. Maybe you can see it better. So this is like just my regular shell prompt, and I've typed sudo target CLI. This is my sudo script. So I've typed sudo target CLI because you have to be root. And it's giving me this prompt right here. It just gives me this prompt. It tells me my directory name and a greater than sign, so just like a shell. And the only thing I've done is type ls. And the ls in this is like ls, but a little different. It's always recursive, so it shows everything below me. And it's always long and has this format. So these are the same nodes that we just saw. That this is backstores with subdirectories. And iSCSI, and these are the front ends here available. Is, is this like, can you read this at all? We, we can when you read it to us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so we're doing fine. Good. We're doing okay. Okay. Well, the left side's clear. We got to do the best with what I have, sorry. I can actually show you this in a shell in a minute, but let's finish this part first. Um, so we're going to create the back store and I decided to put it in a file, because that's easier to do. I don't have a whole partition on my system, so I'm just going to put it in a file. And I have room for a 10 gigabyte file. And so I'm going to let Target CLI create it for me, because it can create a sparse file. And I have to look up how to do, how to do that. So all I have to do is have a directory somewhere, and I'm going to tell it to create the file for me. And I have to give this back end a name so that I can connect to the front. Okay, we're working there, aren't so, here I'm at the prompt again with a slash, and I've typed all of this. The first line here, and it says, backstores file IO. So that's the directory that I want. To, I want to back up a minute, make this clear. 
Each command, each directory has its own command. I kind of told you that. If you want to run the commands in this directory, you can cd here and just type the command like create. Or from this directory, you can type iSCSI create, just like you can type the whole path name in Linux for, to get to something. So that's what I'm doing just because I'm lazy. <laughs> I've stayed in the root directory. I haven't cd down to the file IO, which I want to create a file IO back in, so I want to be in that directory. But I'm lazy, I don't want to CD there, so I just type the path name, backstores, file IO, create. I give it a name and a directory and a size. And by the way, there's help too. If you just go in that directory and type help, it would explain this to you. So, and it has responded with green. Green is good. Create file IO, Fred, 01, with a size of 10 gigabytes. So now there's a file. If I went in LS, I would see a file out there. Wow. Two questions. Are you running these on the um, like the room one store um, machine or the, on the client? Because you talk about it's the same machine. Oh, I see. the same machine for both. Okay, but you could have two different ones. Yes. Okay. And this would be done on uh, where? On the server machine. On the server. Where you wanted your target. Okay. So now I just typed ls again to show that it's changed after I did this. Now I have a, a file I.O. entry here. And these weren't here before. You don't really have to pay attention to this stuff on your Fred. It does that for you. And I want to point out that it's probably really hard to see in the glare. Now we have green over here. It was all white before, and the green is good. So that means we're setting up things correctly. So now we have the back end. The back end's ready, but now we we'll just make the front. And we're going to have to pick a name. Well, we don't have to. It'll pick one for you if you want. And we have to decide what network interfaces we want to listen on. By default, it's all. And we're going to set up an access control list, too. So now I'm doing, uh, I've typed in, this is what we saw before, I've typed in iSCSI create. So again, I'm still in the root directory, but I've said in the iSCSI subdirectory, run the create command. And that's a name I want to use. That's all I have to give it, it's just some name that, it makes sure it matches the format if I just typed blog there. But as long as it starts with IQN, you can kind of do anything. And so I printed a name, and it, it worked. It gave me four lines of green. It says it created it, and then it also said, by the way, I set up your network listing for you by default, because that's the default. I could do it manually, but what the heck. So now I went up to the top of the screen and done an LS again. And you can see everything. Here's the Fred was here before, and here's the thing I just added. And this target portal group is a, another thing we can kind of just ignore. It does it for us. Here's the things that we care about. The, the things you have to fill in on the front end are the ACLs, your access control list, what LUNs you are, and those are just a connection to this, and the portal, which is where you're listening. Because this target has to be listening for initiators. So now I'm going to actually change directories, because again, I'm lazy and I don't like typing a lot. So I'm going to CD to this directory here, this target portal group, which is the one right under our new target, just so I can get access to these things without having to type too much. So I CD there, and now you can see my prompt changes. That's automatic. So now I'm going to configure the front end. I have to have ACL and uh, MUN. So here I am again, just showing this on a clean screen. Now, uh, the problem is, for an ACL, you have to know the name of your initiator. So I'm jumping ahead here, and I'm looking up the name of my initiator. Um, the OpenIce does the initiator package, which we're going to use in a minute. This is the file that it keeps its name in. So it's, I've, I've just, as sudo, dumped out the file, and here's the file. And this is filled in by default when you install OpenIce does it. You can go in there and edit it if you want to set your own initiator name. So I've done that. I've actually edited this. So this is my initiator name, and I have to cut and paste that back into the shell that we were just looking at. So I've done that. And I say, here's my empty uh, target. And here I say, OK, under the ACLs, create one for this initiator name. That's the one I just got. And it worked. And then I also want to create a LUN, which is a connection to the back end. And I say, in the LUNs subdirectory, run the create command. And that create command needs the path name of my 
Fred, <laughs> which is backstores file angle Fred. So boom, it's done that. Let's see how it looks. That's how it looks. So here's your target part group. The ACLs was empty before and Mons was empty before. Everything is green and white, no red. Now I think I'm gonna show how the whole thing looks. So that's everything, all configured. Our target is configured now, theoretically. So I'm in this directory still, way down here, but I, I wanted to ls the whole thing, so I just typed ls of slash. And it shows me everything. And you can see over here on the side, all the green. Activated is good. Earlier it said inactive before we had it connected. So now everything's connected. You can see there are everything here. Mentions Fred. <laughs> So Fred is the name of this guy, so now they're connected. We have a whole target. So let's set up the initiator. Okay, open our SCSI package. The other one uses the target CLI package. We're gonna use the open SCSI package. It has one or two or three pieces, depending on which distribution you're on. Um, but the command we're gonna use, it's command line interface, is iSCSI admin. There's a daemon in the background, which we don't really care about. So there's two parts to this, really, um, or there's two main parts to using uh, Open iSCSI to connect to a target. There's discovery, and then you create a session. You really can't create a session until you have discovered the thing. So you have to go out and you have to go to the one way, there's several ways of doing discovery. But the main way is you go to the, to the IP address where you know your target is, and you talk to the server there, who we saw, just saw was listening on port 37, 32, whatever port that one. And so we go to that uh, server and we say, give me a list of your targets. It's called the send targets command. So we're going to just get a list of targets. And then once we have a list of targets, then we can say, OK, I want to log into this one or this one or all of them. The iSCSI admin command line interface has so many things it does that it kind of breaks them down by mode. So there's these different modes that we're going to use, like discovery mode, session mode, Node mode, nodes are the database. So there's a little summary of the modes we're going to use. Yeah, as I mentioned, the database is called nodes or records. I don't know why I have so many different terms for it. They're really just files in a directory tree. Uh, but that's the way they implement the database. But it's really a name value pair database. So here I'm showing the command. Is this a little bit still? Good. The color was kind of weird. So uh, what I've done here is just shown from the beginning with an empty system that there's no records. So this, I said iSCSI admin in mode, node, I'm sorry, node mode. Um, and if you don't pass in any sub options, the default is to show all your nodes. So there's no nodes. And the same thing with sessions. I said, show me all your sessions. There's none. That's to be expected. So now I'm going to create a node by discovering our new target that we just made. So this is the format here, discovery mode, send targets. That should be the default, but it's not. You have to tell it what type of discovery. And that's the system we want to talk to, which is the same one we're on. And so I could give it any IP address, but I know where my target is. It's at that one. And sure enough, it comes back pretty quickly with this one line, which is the target we just discovered. There's the name that we created, test01. And there's the IP address I found it at. So now we have a node in our database. And then when I say list all your nodes, it shows the same thing we just saw. But we still don't have any sessions. So now let's create a session. So I say in the node mode, Log in. That's a, you can do dash dash log in. This is the short version. I'm so used to this, I don't uh, use the long version very much. Um, but this is a shortcut to say for every single node that I mentioned here, and this is all of them because I haven't specified a node, log in. But I only have one node, so I'm kind of being lazy. If you have lots of nodes in your database, you can tell it which one to log in. So it does it here. It says logging in. Oops, I logged in. It worked. Successful. Um, there's lots of reasons it might not work too. If you have your 
ACL setting correctly, or uh, maybe you have a chat, which is a higher level security setup, and you didn't set it up here, but it's set up on the target. There's lots of reasons this could fail. Um, but it worked. So now I say list your sessions, and there's a session. One per line, it's showing me this TCP, which is the transport, and the session ID, and the IP address, and the name, and the fact that it's not firmware. So that's pretty much it. Now I want to show, like, let's actually use it. All right, so here I am on the command line again. I have a session, I show it. Now I'm showing, do I have any disk drives? Yes. So unfortunately, I didn't show ahead of time that before the session, I didn't have any disk drives. Because this is an NVMe system. There is no SCSI disks. But now, iSCSI has created a SCSI disk. SCSI disk A, because that was the next name available. And but I can't be sure, so I'm going to run the inquiry on it. I'm going to just run the inquiry command on it to see, like, show me the information. And sure enough, I get a bunch of information, but down here, there's Fred. <laughs> and LIO is the name of the target system in the kernel. But what do you do? That looks like our disk. So now, uh, let's see if it has any partitions on it, because we need a partition if we're going to put a file system on it. So now I've said, is there any other partition between, you know, uh, I don't know how many people uh, manage disk drives much, but, you know, uh, SDA <coughs> is the name of the disk, and each partition is SDA1, SDA2, SDA3. And so if there's any other partitions, they would be shown with this asterisk, but nope, there's no partition. So I'm going to use this command, pardon, which is a standard, one of the standard commands for partitioning. And I'm going to just create one partition for the whole disk. Pretty simple. And now I list, uh, and there is two, see there's SDA and SDA1. Pretty simple. <coughs> so now I'm going to put a file system on it. I just pick XFS, and I put it on there, and then I mount it. And I LS, it's empty. That doesn't <coughs> empty. So let's copy some files in there and see if they go away when I unmount it. So I copy a directory tree in there, and sure enough, the files are there. Now I unmount it, and the files are gone. So the mount worked. I wasn't just writing into the mount directory and the unmount work. So now, those bits that I just copied in there are in the file called bs.imv for the block storage image on that old bs directory. And that, so that is the disk drive now, and I just disconnect it. If I go and connect it, they'll still be here. So that's pretty much it for the iSCSI stuff. I want to talk about some advanced stuff a little bit. Is there any questions before I do? So. In a lot of protocols like this, um, SMB3, Active Directory, RDP, TCPIP is going away, being replaced primarily with the Google created quick QUIC. Is there any talk about that here? No. I haven't heard any talk about that in Linux in general, although I'm not an application person. Okay. So, so uh, quick, mostly well, deals with PLS, like adding that to the handshake. So, I think that's a different use case. I don't. Really well, there's good. quick, and then I think there's actually something kind of maybe even replacing quick, but what it does is it makes session setup much faster, so it combines the yeah, TCP yeah, handshake, the TLS handshake, and then once you have that going, you can multiplex, so if you have multiple things like this and file sharing between the same clients and server, then they can leverage the same connection, and so... This security is pretty primitive compared to it. It doesn't even do TLS, I and, yeah, and, and they recommend you use Kerberos if you want real security. Yeah, I, I mean, of course, not that this is a serious issue, but, but, but this is like bare bones NFS. It's an unencrypted passage, which we just didn't care about. That's normally just fine, but but if you were doing this over a wide area network, I'd want yeah. to put it through an SSH tunnel yeah. or something. Yeah, and there's uh, for a long time, there's been um, on low level, you could be encrypt. Uh, password and it doesn't pass any clear text. It's a, it uses a handshake protocol. And they recently finally upgraded that. It took like 20 years to completely. Yeah, the other thing with Quick is um, nobody uses TCPIP as a streaming protocol, really, it's packets. And, and so while Quick is a. Um, UDP. Is, is a, is, is a um, connection oriented endpoint, is packet oriented, like UDP. 
haven't even heard any talk about this. So okay. I don't know. It might be exactly. We're putting on QUIC is the protocol. Okay. okay. Um, just a quick uh, a recap. So I saw uh, when you were setting up Fred, it said that you had to already have a full folder created. Um, yes. Where you put it. So. Right. Um, you just have to specify a directory where I can put the file. Okay. So you that one was created ahead of time, and then you created Fred. Um, and then the other piece about you said NVMe is not a SCSI drive. So did you had to create the SDA or? No, actually, um, yeah, so let's say I did have a SCSI disk on that virtual machine, it would have been SDA, and the, and the new disk created would have been SDB, for example. Yeah. But, um, but mine is an NVMe 0P1, or whatever they name it, okay. NVMe stuff. And, and the target command or whatnot creates the new special buckets. Creates the what? The, creates the, um, the this, uh, SDA or SDA. Yeah, program. actually, it's uh, UDEV. Yeah, and I think yeah. I mentioned that in one slide, if not, I should have. So the UDEV subsystem on Linux is a cool device subsystem that talks with the kernel. It knows when device events happen. And so it sees the fact that there's a new SCSI connection and it creates a disk drive for you. So it just shows up after you create a session and there's just a disk drive there. Now your data on the, on the disk that's on the server, I presume only one Client machine can mount that at a time because this is just like, just like it's a hard drive in the machine. I think you can actually have multiple people connect to the same target at the same time. But is that a good idea? <laughs> yeah, it would be a bad idea. Yeah. But they can also, yeah. Isn't there some sort of security that keeps that from happening? Uh, well, I mean, I'm going to mention security that yeah. you could do it. But even if you have security, these might both be secure but not know about each other, so that would be bad. Now, it would be practical, though, to use that as a removable disk drive where um, one machine may be using that disk drive before a couple hours, hours and, one. Then another machine, and then another guy uses it. For example, I think some clustering software does it on purpose and they use it, a drive as a core on device or something to see who's in charge of it. So they both write to it and they see who we can so yeah. You could also, I'm assuming, have one writer and multiple readers. It's like a cache distribution. Sure. Please don't do this to me. I think I'm going to have to take it back. Yeah, it would be better if you didn't have that. We have that type of operation. Uh, I mean. Uh, I one other question. Sure. Just, just, I wanted to confirm. My understanding is that the, the backing storage is essentially not iSCSI aware. Right, like you could exactly. just take that image and you could put have it on a it different through. protocol and run that. That supports other things besides I suppose that target thing. So yeah, it could be okay. a backend could be connected to NVMe. I think it was NVMe. It could be connected to some other front ends. They have like a. Okay. So that, that's the whole idea of the, of the target CLI. Why they broke apart the front end and the back end, so you could do that. I guess I'm thinking also even the other way though. Like I could in theory take that image, like Fred. And then I could use that, let's say, as a hard drive to boot a VM off of it yeah. if I took it out of the SCSI system, right? Like, there's nothing SCSI specific about the actual bytes on that raw storage. No, there's okay. not. Yeah. Cool. I mean, but you'd have to figure out a way if you have a file that's a disk image, how to import that into whatever else you want to do. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So just yeah. hypothetically. Yeah, I, I came out a few minutes late, so I don't know if you addressed this, but I'm just curious to know, like, what are some use cases for you which use SCSI over NFS? On picturing like a scenario with maybe like a virtual machine having a bump disk, but uh, what other scenarios? It's used a lot for virtual machines because yeah. you can carve up. It's just another way, if it's one, one thing you can do with it is carve up a big hunk of storage for lots of different users. Like if you had one system that had a huge storage on it, you wanted to share it with everybody else. There's other ways to do that too, like in the past. Sure. Yeah. It, it allows you, to, it would allow you to kind of use an as and partition your out onto a lot of individual machines. And, and actually, I prefer this to NFS because NFS um, isn't unique enough. Uh, I mean, you're, you're, things can get shared too many places with NFS. 
so much. You're really careful with the um, um, with the exports going on. Well, this is actually more common usage, I think, if the large usage is for booting VMs. You can boot for MySCSI too, and I mentioned for yeah. targets and booting. Okay. And that's a little more complicated because it's like a chicken egg and they don't yeah. import um, So I think a lot of big uh, vendors use it for that. But uh, yeah, a lot of my bugs that I fix come from vendors, not from end users. So I don't know if that's a so I, I want to talk briefly about uh, some ex things about iSCSI system D. Uh, everybody loves and hates, but that's how we make sure it's running. And also, I wanted to quickly mention more uh, access control, more secure. So system D controls things on almost every distribution these days. And um, you only care if you want to install this package yourself and make sure it's running. System D is a thing to make sure there's like enable and start or things you can do with a package. Enable says, um, next time you reboot, um, start it up. Start and start it right now. So if we install these packages, we're going to have to do that. And uh, again, this is the tumbleweed example. So for the target, um, the initiator, OpenISCSI has a couple of different system deep things, and the target has one. So I'm going to kind of skip over this. This is the target file. It's probably very hard to read to, but this is a system D control file. And it just says the main thing that matters here is when it starts, it's just going to run the target CLI command and restore the configuration. So that way, every time you start this service, the configuration just shows up. Okay, and the initiator uses two different services, one for the daemon and one for automatic logging, which I'll talk about in a second. So. The daemon is controlled by a socket. System D has this thing called socket activation. It's optional. So the daemon isn't actually running until the first time somebody tries to talk to it, and then system D starts it up and connects it. And the way it's designed, it just stays running after that. But so that's what that iSCSI D socket service does. And then this iSCSI dot service is for automatic logins. If you have a target, let's say on a remote server that you want to be there every time you boot up your system, you can set it up to do that, and that's the service that does it. And another iSCSI D, this is the iSCSI D service, and you can see the main thing it does here is run the daemon. And this is the one for the login service, and the main thing it does is just run the iSCSI admin command in node mode, and it says log into everything that's set up to be automatic. So how do you do that? the node database, the node database that I mentioned. So after you discover something, you have this node entry. Even if you don't look at it, it's there, and it has uh, like 50 or 70 name value pairs of things that are configured for that target. And so what you need to do is you need to go in and change one of those if you want it to automatically log in. So again, sorry about these colors. So this is the same thing I checked earlier. This is the mode node, and I say list all your nodes, and list, I only have one. Now I want to, I want to, well, I want to change the startup value. I can't remember what it's called because I always forget, so I know it's got startup in it. So I just say in node mode, show me all your name value pairs, and I'm just wrecking for startup. And so there's two of them. You can see here I found two. They're actually redundant. It's an implementation detail. It's kind of stupid, but we're stuck with it. So there's two. There's these two values, and you can change either one of those to automatic. You see it's manual. There's only three, manual, automatic, and on boot in the main page. So we're going to set it to automatic, and I do it in this one command here. Node mode, I want to update the node database for every single node. I only have one node. And I want to change this name to this value. And so now when I check again, you can see it changed it right there. So now when the service starts up, it's going to every time, because of that service, if I enable it here, that service will log into it every time I boot. So this is how with system control, which is a system D command, you enable and start, enable and start, enable and start these three things. And then it's running. This is if you have to administer your own system, of course. But if you're playing around with root, you probably have to. So I, I want to briefly uh, mention X, uh, 
better security too here? I got about five more minutes, I think. And then I want to leave more time. So <clears throat> I mentioned earlier CHAP. CHAP is a challenge handshake authentication protocol. And uh, complicated, too complicated for me. But um, it's, in, it's implemented in both the machine and the target. And I think it's required as part of the standard. And they also have some other optional algorithms you can do. But CHAP is required. So if you want extra security, you can use this in several different ways. One is you can say, I don't even want you to be able to discover my targets unless you have my name and password. If, or you can do that or not, but you can also add a separate choice. You can say, I don't want you to be able to create a session without a different name and password. And if you're really, if, so that's kind of sort of the target if he doesn't trust the initiative. The target says, you better know the name and password or else you can't come here. It's kind of like you better know the combination of the law. Right, but what if the initiator doesn't trust the target? You can also have a reverse uh, name and password for the target. So there's three different sets you can set there. And this is kind of in addition to the access control list, if you wish. Right? So you have to have the right name and you have to know the name and password. Even so, it's not going to be completely secure, as we were saying earlier. Things are going to be ended up. Data is going to end up in the clear, so you really want if you're worried about the data, then you need something besides this. But this just sets up the session. And where did my remote go? I set it down. So that's it for iSCSI. It's pretty easy to play around with. You can roll your own sand. And uh, actually, iSCSI is used by some vendors to add uh, internal clustering protocol, as I mentioned. So. And you can find out more if you check on the readme that comes with OpenXCSI. It's usually installed as part of the package. Um, and you can see here I just scratched for it on my system and found the password for it. It's also if you download the, the source code, it's in the top level there. It has a lot of details about how to configure iSCSI for different situations. Um, just, you know, like if you're doing multi-path, a lot of people that want reliability have two paths to their target and then they use multi-path on top of them. So in that case, you want a faster timeout because you want it to fail over the other path. So there's things like that that should be configured depending on the situation. Unfortunately, we can't make it smart enough to do that for you. Not easily. Enough. And um, also the configuration file here that's installed on every system when you install OpenX because it has a lot of mm -hmm. details. So how do you debug this thing? I imagine there's a Wireshark parser and there's an RFC. You can use Wireshark and it understands the iSCSI protocol. So you can Um, also, both the command line interface for our iSCSI admin and the demon have debug or whole software line. So you can make it chatty. Yes. And for the target, which I don't actually work on as much, uh, the kernel target code, um, you know, well, the shell is Python, so that's easy. <laughs> to debug. You just go in and in it's just so you the code. Um, but the kernel code has modules, and you can set like debugging on them and have output. Alright. In the case of multi-pathing you mentioned, is that does that work by setting up connect simultaneous connections and then favoring one and failing off like with well, the hot standby? Path is there is this uh, you can choose that whether you want it to like alternate or if they already switch up the other one. Okay. Okay, cool. But it's active it's actually it could be active active. I don't know if you're familiar, there's multiple kinds of multi pathing. There's active passive. Like a lot of commercial disk drives say they have two paths, so if you switch over to this one, now it's the main path, this is the alternate path. So you really don't want to do that for every other I.O. on the same systems. But you can do either with this because both are connected. But generally what you want to do is you would create a, there's a couple ways you can do it. You could have, I mentioned target portal groups that we didn't have to pay attention to, but you can create a second one of those so you can have two paths. They're slightly different, but they're talking about the same target. Still gives me a chuckle that it's called a small computer. Uh, it, it tells you that the person inventing the technology didn't have the vision that it could be something bigger. Yeah, I think at the time, you know, like I, IBM mainframes were the, the 
the not smoking version. I first saw this on Wayne BS as he had those big black A and B cables. And well, uh, in the you know in the mid mid time, I guess uh, we had all the disc drives and tape drives, and I, I don't know what all we had. And every damn one had its own interface card that, that was proprietary. In ridiculous cables, too. Yeah, and, and it really says he was just wonderful. Because they, they gave us a standard. Uh, yeah, no, that's true. I'm just saying, yeah. I'm, I'm just, they didn't need the word small in front of it. Yeah, and those small machines were the size of the refrigerator. Especially since my 200 media had this pack was the size of a. <laughs> yeah. Yes.